All right, why don't we go ahead and get started again? Welcome back. You're at the uh, first day of the uh, virtual event for the um, CNI uh, 2021 uh, fall uh, member meeting. And um, we have a really uh, wonderful session coming up, I think. Um, so I'm glad you came back and joined us. So, let me very briefly introduce this session um, and get out of the way because uh, we don't really want to hear from me. We want to hear from our guests today. So the Council on Library and Information Resources has for a number of years been running an absolutely wonderful program called the Clear Post Doctoral Fellows Program. Uh, here they take um, uh, mostly, I think, pretty recent PhDs and give them an opportunity to do things with libraries and the cultural uh, uh, memory sector broadly. And um, these folks have cadre after cadre done just wonderful, wonderful work. And um, back in the times before the pandemic, we used to invite every year the current cadre of Clear Fellows to be with us at our membership meetings. And they had an opportunity to meet a lot of our member reps. Um, their work is very much in the same community as our work. Uh, often they find uh, jobs and roles ultimately at our member institutions. Um, and they would bring fresh and fascinating questions and comments to the discussions um, and presentations uh, that happened at our meetings. Then the pandemic came. And like so many other people coming into a community, they were greatly disadvantaged by the move to the virtual environment. So one of the things that CNI has been doing ever since we have had to move our um, meetings to the virtual environment, and um, uh, we will have to see what happens going forward, whether the best solution is virtual, in-person, or a mix of the two. Um, but what we've been doing is inviting a few members of the current cadre every session, or every meeting, to join us, introduce themselves, and talk a bit about the work they're doing and about um, uh, how, how they're seeing the environment and the challenges uh, going forward into their careers um, as Clear Fellows and beyond. Um, perhaps to talk a little bit about their aspirations um, uh, as they move uh, past their clear fellowships into um, broader professional roles. And we have with us um, uh, four clear fellows today, um, uh, Petrushka, Kevin, Francesca, and uh, Laura. And I'm so grateful to them all for being here today. I'm going to get out of the way now and invite each of them to share with us for about eight or nine minutes, and then uh, um, we'll field a question or two at the end, uh, time permitting. Um, uh, so um, welcome. Thank you all for being here. And why don't we just go in, um, in alpha order? That seems to make as much sense as anything else. So um, over to you, Petrushka. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am Dr. Petrushka Moise, and I am based out of Grinnell College uh, in Grinnell, Iowa. And I am a 2020 fellow uh, working with the Waterloo Center for the Arts um, in Grinnell College in digitizing the largest collection of publication art. And um, kind of was thrown off. I was kind of getting excited. I was like, okay, great. I'm P. 
so I should be last. <laughs> um, but um, in order to kind of uh, share with you guys the, the work that I've been doing, um, I've kind of prepared a short slide and I'm going to go ahead and uh, share that with you guys right now. Let me see, screen one and share. And let me go ahead and put that in uh, exhibition mode. Right. So uh, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm very, very much honored to talk about not only the work that we've been doing, but the kind of experiences that they've been based on. And um, so it was like, how did COVID welcomed me to clear. And in that effort, um, there were so many things that was happening because at that time, um, I had just completed my Doctor of Design in Cultural Preservation at LSU. I was riding the high of being the first of this uh, program for the state of Louisiana. And I defended right as COVID hit. And so, I was happy that I was the first one out the gate and the last one out the gate. Um, and then we were supposed to do an exhibition and then COVID shut it all down. And my whole mindset was, I'm gonna be on Bourbon Street living my best life because we did not know what tomorrow was going to bring. Um, and then Claire called and said that I was selected to have this, what I consider to be a dream job. Um, in the process, then it was thinking about how to relocate to Iowa. Uh, I am of Haitian descent. I've always lived off the water. So this was the first time that I was coming into middle America. And when we, I arrived at Grinnell, um, we ended up having, and I, I swear I didn't bring it with me, but we had our first hurricane. The derecho came across the Midwest and we were impacted. And for the first week, couple of weeks, we were living in and out of hotels. We did not know when campus was going to be open. Uh, Grinnell is a town of 9,000. So there was severe impact um, to the town, to, to how we were going to operate on top of COVID. So there was a lot of how do I establish myself? How do I make myself known here? Um, how do I follow the lead when I'm being isolated in my home? Then within, and this is still not the start of school and this is not the start of the project. Um, then right after the direct show, unfortunately we had an incident that did not make national acclaim, but it was very impactful. A, a gentleman was lynched in in Grinnell. And that brought some a great level of trepidation for me as to why am I here? What am I doing? What is this all for? Especially when the, the news trickled down to my family and friends who were very much concerned with my placement here in this project. And so as I moved forward from this trauma and this drama that was circulating the town and the school, um, it kind of helped me to reassure the work that I needed to do. Because with this effort, one of the things that was personally crossing my mind was that myself as a Black woman, as a Black mother, as coming from a large family, when you are in a space that is endangered and you don't understand what that landscape is, how do we establish our sense of normal normality, especially since at the same time that this had happened, my brother had flown in from Miami to spend time with me. And I was, and he's my baby brother. So I was very much into that matriarchal protect the family mode and started to think historically what we've established in the home, how we've established our society and some of the things that we look for as archival indicators of cultural life of how we have these conversations, these prayer circles, these table conversations, these games that we play to keep our families safe. And then I started to realize the importance of my role here, looking at Haitian art and culture, um, especially being Haitian, 
and especially in a strange location like the middle of Iowa to have all of this. Um, another thing that COVID brought about was in the sense of isolation of we were not allowed to teach for the first year on campus. So there was no campus life. So my orientation really was looking at myself and thinking that I don't live in the enclaves with a Haitian culture or Haitian society, such as Brooklyn, Miami, or New Orleans that I have lived in, where there was a direct sustainability or reinforcement of who you are and why you're here. And so I looked at the collection in the same way that this was, who am I in the middle of the corn? What is this collection in the middle of the corn? And so what I was able to do was be very, very aggressive in my efforts to approaching the project. So we were initially working with the Waterloo Collection. And so that has 12,600 objects. We were able to photo, we were able to photograph all of that in the first year. So when I was working with my supervisors and working with my with this community, um, their intent at initially for me was that I was going to design the plan and build it, uh, take the two years to just kind of plan it out. And I was like, nope, I need to build this baby. I need to make sure that by the time that I leave in my two years, that we know that I was here. <laughs> so I said, Fig figure it out. They're going to love me or they're going to hate me, but they'll never forget me. So I was very aggressive with that. And then from the Waterloo and then started to learn how there is an entire map of the United States where there is Haitian art collections everywhere. I really started to expand my scope and really take a look at the different things that we needed to consider. So the fact that Haitians speak four languages, how were we going to be able to translate all of that? What were some of the multilingual needs? What were some of the structural needs? So we were able to, I was able to kind of build some foundational guidelines for myself. Um, and then we reached out and we talked to other partners across the United States that were associated with Haitian communities. And we were able to talk to them about coming on board with this project. And that helped me to really build some feet to this project and helping to negotiate and navigate with my identity as part of my narrative. And so in talking to these communities, really trying to see how much does the community play in these institutions and how they plan to archive their work and display future works, especially with the dynamics of COVID. What have we learned from COVID with our engagement of reaching into the community, gathering from the community, and how much um, ownership does the community have moving forward? So in our first year, we've been able to write um, two grants, uh, wrote a hidden collections grant with Claire, as well as an NEH grant to build up this project. And so in moving forward, we definitely, and I feel like we should definitely challenge the scholarship of looking at how things are contextualized, looking at how diasporic artists like myself that are born outside of Haiti, how do we contribute to that narrative? And then also breaking the legacy of endangered spaces, um, bringing that forward into the community. Um, let me see, I don't know how much time I have left. Uh, if somebody will let me know how much time I have left, but um, let's see, what I wanted to share was that there is a wonder in the finding of when you're working with works like this. And what I hope that my time at Clear and my work at Grinnell does is to help me look at the different ripples and how we're challenging how information is gathered and stored. So one of the things that I went back to was my mother tongue. And speaking in Creole, I realized that through the Library of Congress or through the Getty Foundation, we have very Western ways of defining things, but in our language, we have very acute words. And so we didn't, I just didn't want to just go and say, oh, we're just going to keep up with best practice because when I saw that there were gaps in the practice. So we've created this methodology that I call going beyond provenance, where we are trying to eliminate the silent and dispel and stop utilizing the words of unknown or anonymous 
or anonymous that are currently used right now in Haitian art. So this is a quick snapshot of how I was able to unpack what we've utilized, what we have come to utilize as five lines of data in MARC and expand that into now 120 lines of data. And in doing so, we're able to put back the narrative and help connect the stories between the artist, the object, the exhibition, the cataloging, the auctions by giving a bigger footprint to the Haitian cultural experience. So by looking at the spaces that we've been in before and looking at the spaces we're going to continue to be in, I'm looking at things that have never been in the data before, which is the exhibition history, curatorial notes, and catalog history, and therefore creating more intersections of who we are as Haitian artists. So my hashtag is always making your ripple count. And in conclusion, I wanted to um, share that as an artist and as an archivist and as a librarian, I'm looking at spaces that artists can utilize and reference their own, in, their own traditions, as opposed to real, relying on museums or critics to build the narrative that we bring ownership to our own voices in the digital age. And we understand that the digital realm is not the only place that we can account for, but we have the ability to negate the silence that we've seen in the Haitian art culture and start to dismantle some narratives and bring about some new ways of thinking. So thank you guys very much. Thank you for that. That's fascinating. Um, I, I will just extend an invitation. Please think about um, at some future CNI submitting an in-depth look at what you're doing here. There are so many fascinating pieces here that are relevant that obviously we can't get into in, in the small amount of time here. Um, but thank you so much for that. Uh, Francina, over to you. Hello, everybody. My name is Dr. Francina Turner, and I, um, like Petrushka, but a little different, I was in the process of writing my dissertation um, when I found out that I had um, been selected as the Clear Fellow for the Maryland Institute for Technology and Humanities. And it was um, a really interesting experience because what I do in my postdoc is exactly what I want to do in my career and also exactly kind of what my dissertation was about. Um, so it all seemed to, to line up pretty well. Um, in the early phases, COVID caused me to, um, the, the, the sort of um, constraints of COVID meant that I got a job offer before I was finished with my dissertation. I had to do a mad dash to finish. So that was the most interesting and um, disheveled time of my life, really. Um, and then in terms of, um, how COVID affected my project. My project is relationship-based and I did not relocate to the city um, in which uh, College Park in which my postdoc is, is located. I relocated to my hometown. Um, I'm in Fayetteville, North Carolina and I do all my work virtually to College Park. And so when you're doing a project that's very much relationship-based that can be, um, that can make for us intense times or at least some uncomfortable times. Um, I'm gonna put some links into the chat um, of kind of what I'm working on. The first link is to the um, landing page for our overall project. I'm working on a sub portion of that and then to the one page of describing um, the project. So the project I'm working on, um, I'm an oral historian essentially, and it's called a a part of the reparative history in university archives initiative um, for the University of Maryland's um, university archives. My project is the black experience at UMD. It's the first um, kind of official oral history project for the University of Maryland. Um, and when we deposit ours and, and do the um, a session it into the library will be the test case for putting oral histories and making them available in the system that they have. Um, I am not on a team of one. 
I work collaboratively with the project heads, which would be um, Leo Hughes Watkins, who's a university archivist, and my supervisor, advisor, mentor, um, Aaliyah Brown, got a wonderful opportunity and left the institution um, a couple months ago. So, but in terms of the project that I do, it is a, pers a team of one because I've done all of the archival research, which took several months. Um, and then developing the relationships and doing the oral history interviews. I had a um, goal of 10 um, within, by this time point, by the end of December, um, we felt with COVID that maybe I wouldn't be able to build the relationships that oral history um, necessitates, um, but I was able to do that. And I got triple that number of interviews and we have more scheduled and I've developed working relationships with um, different organizations related to Black alumni of the University of Maryland. So that's actually worked better than I hoped. Um, a lot of the fears I had um, didn't pan out the way I, I was scared they might. Um, also, I did have some experience doing this kind of work um, completely virtually because I wrote my dissertation about my hometown while I was in Illinois. So I had to use, make use of, of digital archives and develop relationships to do oral history interviews virtually, which is the same thing I've done in this situation. Um, the project was precipitated by um, the murder of um, Lieutenant Collins on UMD's campus by a UMD student, and also by the death of a student athlete named Jordan McNair. And so the question that um, we were asking is, how do you how do you memorialize or mourn something that's ongoing? What it, well, how are Black students experiencing this campus and, and the surrounding community? Um, I've also um, done a great deal of work in creating and dis, um, disseminating social media blurbs around a project and doing a lot of outreach. Um, what's coming next, um, next semester and, and for really the next year, is while I'm still collecting oral history interviews and transcribing and doing all of that um, direct work, we're also looking at um, different kinds of public facing exhibits, panel discussions, um, a, a microsite for our, our individual project, um, giving talks, presenting at conferences, things of those nature, um, trying to organize those topically. And the most impactful part of what I've done is that one that is the first kind of expansive oral history project for the institution. Um, UMD didn't admit black students until the late 1950s. And there's not been this kind of research done on the collective uh, uh, black population before. Um, I'm also always excited to um, contribute to connecting um, black communities across time and space. And we're doing that. I've interviewed people in every decade that students have been able to, to go to the institution. Um, and this project is the first of several sub projects. We also have one around LGBT students, around um, the Black Greek letter organizations, and then going forward, some other um, ethnic organizations or ethnic groups within the institution. And so COVID. The, the, the effects of COVID just really meant I had to be creative and I had to trust myself um, that I could um, develop relationships regardless of kind of not being there. I think the one big thing that was an issue is that I'm not familiar with the campus and there are ways that people tell their stories that are very connected to place. Um, so going forward into the next semester, I'm gonna make several trips to familiarize myself with the space and things of that nature. Um, and so, yeah, that's what I have. I've really enjoyed my work um, and it, it's been an amazing experience to be able to do, to continue to do the kind of work that I love. Um, and so going forward in terms of my own personal plans is I would like to continue to do this kind of work. Um, oral history projects um, and all of the resulting um, public facing um, ways that we can make that um, we can collaborate with the communities we um, interview and research to make that information and those stories available um, publicly. Thank you so much for that. That th there are so many interesting elements in that. Um, uh, the, the place versus doing it online and so much. Uh, that was just great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
Let's see, Laura, I think you're next. Yeah, wonderful. Um, so um, I have a little bit of a, um, I want to call it a script, but I've written like a little speech just because my anxiety won't let me not do that. Um, so thank you to everyone at CNI um, and to Cliff for offering the Clear Fellows these frequent opportunities to present, especially when we can't be there with everybody in person. Um, so like Francina and Patricia, um, I'm a 2020 Clear Fellow in data creation for African American studies, um, and I'm here um, in my office today um, at Fisk University um, in Nashville. But as uh, I hopefully haven't taken on too much of a twang, you might be able to guess that I'm originally from England um, in Oxford, and I moved to the US in 2015 to get my PhD in English Lit at the University of Mississippi. So um, graduated in May with a Zoom dissertation defense, and virtual graduation video ceremony. I know we all um, you know, are very used to those now, um, but which at the very least included a cameo from Morgan Freeman, um, who loves the university's uh, basketball team and has his Duke joint in Clarksdale. So that somewhat made up for it. Um, so people ask me kind of, you know, what, how did you end up here? Um, and the longer I stay, the more I'm like, I don't know, it just keeps, just keeps coming. Um, but I originally went to the University of Mississippi to uh, carry on researching William Faulkner, um, so to be in situ of his papers, his grave, his house, um, and carry on examining the themes that I'd looked at in my undergrad thesis and master's. Um, and I'm still part of that world somewhat. I'm the treasurer for the Faulkner Society, um, work with the Faulkner in the UK network, but I'm just so much more immersed now in um, Southern studies, American literature and history more broadly. Um, so my dissertation was called um, On Southern Soil, the Art and Ecology of Racial Uplift, 1895 to 1950, which aside from reading books all the time, also involved helping the um, Ecology Society do composting. So this counts, the soil in my dissertation. So helping them uh, sift stuff is definitely relevant. Um, and that looked at how authors like Booker T. Washington, Du Bois, and Zora Neale Hurston were using soil as a symbol in their works to look at African American progress in the early 20th century. So recentering the focus back into the South um, rather than um, the North in the Great Migration. And so in this like kind of roundabout way, I guess, um, it meant my application to the Clear Fellowship ended up being really serendipitous. Um, I was finishing the second chapter of the dissertation, which was the Du Bois chapter, and uh, looking at the Jubilee Singers and the architecture of Jubilee Hall, and then a friend posted, Fisk University is looking for a Clear Postdoctoral Fellow. And I was just kind of, okay, that's really, um, you know, seems kind of cosmetic, um, which I mentioned in my application. And now I'm sitting here right now, just about see the spire of Jubilee Hall in the back and um, still can't really get over it. Um, so for the remainder, I just thought I'd talk about one particular project for the um, sake of time that I have the privilege of working on here, which really gets to combine my interest in architecture, landscape, African-American history with the particularly strong collections that we have here at the John Hope and Aurelia E. Franklin Library, where uh, I use most of my employment because um, I'm also uh, on a one-one teaching load um, for African-American studies, um, which is a great component of the fellowship as well. Um, and Fisk was generously awarded one of Clear's Digitizing Hidden Collection grants um, this year. Um, and because of this, the Franklin Library is now going to be able to digitize the Fiskiana collection, um, making the materials much more accessible through a, a central searchable portal. So um, that from what we've learned from the, the restrictions of COVID, you know, having that more digital presence and um, metadata um, online that can be accessed by students, alumni, scholars, the community. Um, and the Fiskiana collection, as its name would, would suggest, is really showcasing just the rich history um, of Fisk um, to inform institutional memory 
um, and really go kind of global. So we have connections to um, Haiti, the Caribbean, Dominican Republic, um, England, India, the Fisk Jubilee Singers went. So there's all of these kind of connections um, and the collection is, is very diverse in terms of material to get to grips with. So we have yearbooks, individual photographs, um, account book ledgers, student examinations, uh, programs, prospective student booklets, newspaper reports, lectures, um, and really just kind of anything, you know, really it's, you know, if, if, a, if an alumni called and said, you know, I participated in homecoming in 1966 and I really wanted to remember what the theme was, that's what the Fiskiana collection um, is, is helpful for. In a, in a, I, I feel like a kind of similar, um, you know, intimate way of, of Francina's interviews and oral history collections of that real um, connection to the university. Um, some treasures that are within this collection are a tour diary and account book from the Jubilee Singers, um, their 1871 world tour, kind of like hotel expenses, um, travel dates, um, and these kind of things. Um, student exam papers that were sent to the Nashville Exposition, in 1884, which is the centennial founding of Nashville, um, showing, you know, Fisk's uh, central position um, in the city, um, and minutes for meetings of Beta Kappa Beta Society, which is a literary appreciation group started um, at Fisk, um, which show heavy involvement from W.E.B. Du Bois when he's at the university, um, which cover about 20 pages of the whole agenda book. Um, and through the ledgers and the accounts, you know, we get to see the growth of the college from 1866 um, through to today, looking at when cornerstones are laid um, for buildings, how student numbers increase, um, and then, you know, famous names and visitors. So Martin Luther King, Langston Hughes, Franklin D. Roosevelt, um, programs for homecoming and Jubilee Day, really just, you know, you're holding on to some of these items and seeing the aura of, of alumni and students and scholars past. Um, so from, from my part, I'm in charge of the data management plan and the workflow, which involves especially outlining uh, guidelines for the ingest. We're still getting Fiskiana, right? Fisk is still um, a living, breathing um, college and we want as much um, history collected as possible, but that means that as part of the data management plan, we need to know how we deal with um, materials when we receive them. Um, and also the archival practices for born digital materials. So um, currently in the um, physical archives, we have the presidential papers from at least um, the heads of FISC up to perhaps the uh, last uh, outgoing president. Um, and so putting into place a way in which we archive um, emails and memos from the current uh, president who's, you know, is only really sending digital material now. Um, so I'm filing and processing uh, materials as they come in, a few materials we have left, um, and then I'll be compiling a finding aid for the collection using archive space, um, the publishing on the web page for the special collections, which I want to be consistent and navigable, so I've kind of taken over the processing side from um, a volunteer who was helping to catalog it and uh, certain files are like Fisk Jubilee Singers, also Jubilee Singers, Singers Jubilee. So I would love it if we could have the Jubilee Singers just under J and Homecoming just under H. Um, our digitization manager is onboarding soon and so I'll be helping them with metadata in the portal, the more digitization site, side um, and making a research project out of it. So getting that scholarly side um, and writing an essay as, as um, you know, uh, Cliff so kindly invited us like to give uh, at, at potentially CNI or other uh, partner conferences. Um, so yeah, I've really learned a lot um, in my time as a Clear Fellow, which is super flown by. Um, the African-American Studies um, Fellows have been blessed by Mellon to get a two-year extension, which I think is going to be really um, beneficial for the knowledge and skills that we acquire. Um, and I've just learned so much already um, that uh, the traditional 
trajectory I'd had in mind for myself post PhD had always been, and you'll stay in academia and you'll be a professor and you'll read books and research and teach all the time. And now I feel like the fellowships really broaden my horizons and I'm looking more into um, the library, archive, museum um, sphere. So in the spirit of manifesting by getting these words out into the universe, my ultimate goal, I think, at the moment would be to uh, go back to one of my favorite places in the world, which is the Bodleian Library, um, and give back to that institution, um, helping them with archiving and, and development. So thank you to Clear, my colleagues in the Fisciana collection, um, and to CNI and all my uh, fellow fellows. Thank you so much. That's That was wonderful. Um, uh, let's get right on to Kevin. And Kevin, I know we're running a little late. Um, we've got a break after this. So if you need to, if you want to go a couple minutes long, don't worry about it. Sure, I'll, I'll try to be quick as well, be mindful of people's times. Um, let me share my screen. Uh, can everyone see my screen? Is it? Okay, it says I'm sharing. Um, I first want to start by saying how incredibly grateful I am as a social movement and digital humanist uh, for the clear community. Uh, I'm a part of the 2019 um, uh, uh, clear community and uh, have been very grateful, one, for um, just the, the, the recognition that comes with being a part of such an incredible group. Um, clear provided the first opportunity um, nationally for uh, a funded, uh, funded cohort of its kind um, in Black data curation and also giving legitimacy to, uh, to Black digital humanities. And I think part of the uh, job market scene uh, right now um, is a direct result of the uh, legitimacy provided to the type of work that we do provided by institutions like CLEAR. Um, so I'm really grateful for the opportunity and the people behind uh, 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 kind of this Black data curation community that I'm a part of. Um, I got hired in uh, 2019, August of 2019, and um, COVID has greatly impacted the, uh, the work and trajectory that I had for myself. Um, originally, my postdoc was located with the Color Conventions Project at the University of Delaware, and part of what I discovered as I was uh, merging myself with the, with the group uh, is that we were also in transition from the University of Delaware to Penn State as we were finding, we were um, creating the Center for Black Digital Research and folding in the Color Conventions Project into this, uh, this new center, uh, which meant that I would be uh, part of the founding team of the two uh, only uh, Black Digital Humanities centers of its kind in the country. My original uh, position was as project manager for the African American History, Culture, Digital Humanities Initiative at the University of Maryland. Um, so this was a really unique opportunity. One, because I was uh, being part of a, a, a new uh, enterprise um, by everyone, but also to have my postdoc transition from one institution to the next. Um, and that happened right in the middle of COVID, presented new challenges that uh, as you can imagine, it was just difficult <laughs> physically moving, but then also uh, the, the new networks that we had to uh, negotiate and also transitioning over uh, the data from one institution's library system to the next. Just all new challenges that we were not necessarily prepared for under the conditions that we were provided. Um, let me see if I can switch this. Um, this is my team. Uh, funny story, I've not met most of them in person yet uh, because of the um, conditions of COVID, but we work with each other every day. Um, it's really been a really interesting uh, uh, community of support. Some of our students are still with the University of Delaware. Many of our students are, are currently at Penn State. And COVID in some ways have provided us an opportunity to, to keep our community uh, fluid and allowing those who were uh, working from distance to stay uh, in conversation with us. So it's really 
expanded our opportunities to work pretty significantly. Uh, as I mentioned, we the, the center uh, began that transition in the summer of 2020. Um, I moved from uh, University of Delaware to Penn State at that time around um, April. And uh, it really transitioned the work that we were doing. Um, certainly as in the hiring process, what we agreed to was transferring, again, this data from one institution to the other. But in the middle of COVID, at the beginning of COVID, I should say, what we found that there was a need for us to be uh, engaged with our communities. And that was going to be a bit of a challenge for a few reasons. One, obviously, is COVID. But then also Penn State is in the middle of the state where the communities, our imagined communities, are at the both the extreme ends of the state, right? Three hours in every direction to um, major cities. So the opportunity uh, commanded us that we um, provide opportunities for public uh, humanities engagement that was going to, one, be something that was actionable in the time of COVID, but then also accessible to communities that just can't get to, to campus. Uh, because of that, I founded the uh, um, Dig Black Studios, which allowed us a, a digital arm to host events to help us one process um, process the, uh, the moment that we were in. Uh, a lot of the work that we ended up doing on a, on a, um, expectedly was putting down the day-to-day -day research that we were doing and picking up the, the work of processing the moment and trying to provide a historical context as best we could to one, the pandemic, two, the political issues that we were dealing with, um, and three, this the kind of collective anxiety that was um, circulating around our communities. Um, from that, we started with panels uh, that we then streamed to our YouTube channel um, and then transitioned into Various events, I think by the end of the year, from 2020 to 2021, we did about 25 events. Um, it's transitioned from processing the moment back into our regularly scheduled kind of research and public engagement in that way. And we found that um, there, were, there was a greater community than we originally imagined who was interested in the, the local histories that we were able to tell. Um, one of our signature events of that time was uh, the Mary Ann Shakiri event series. Uh, Mary Ann Shakiri was a, a prom prominent Black figure, uh, kind of up and down the East Coast and, and transitioning into uh, Canada. So we were able to, um, we were, the event was originally planned to be a, a conference style event that was going to be held in Wilmington. Um, but because of COVID, we transitioned it into uh, a series of about five events um, totaling the year and turned those into panels and live discussions with communities um, online. And it allowed for communities that we just, and if we're, if we're being honest around how we host our events, really don't have access to the college campus as best as we would, we would like. So that looked like... Uh, um, elderly homes that looked like uh, schools, that looked like people who are employed nine to five who are able to view us on cell phones and tablets instead of having to leave work to come to campus. I mean, allow for a more holistic view of, of what we imagine and what we articulate when we talk about community. Um, we were able to successfully do this with our uh, other signature event, the Douglas Day, where we, uh, partner with local institutions to uh, do crowd, community crowdsourcing um, across the country. Um, because of COVID, we had to do this a little differently. Normally we would, we would uh, all uh, locate in a particular institution, physically go there and bring the local community out and also invite pockets of community across the country to also uh, participate in the crowdsourcing event. This year, we asked everybody to do this from home <laughs> and we uh, used the digital to link all of these different 
you know, if you can imagine having different pockets of community versus having everyone be at home, we had to reimagine how to be in community online. And we were able to successfully complete um, the Mary Church to Rail archive. And um, it's just, you know, finding ways to be together when we were told not to leave the house was really uh, the, the, the challenge of the last as a um, year and a half or so, as you can imagine. Um, in addition to that, we, uh, the team and I were able to uh, to put out some of our scheduled scholarships. So we have the, uh, in the spring of 2021, we were able to successfully get out our uh, edited collection book, which is really more of a community driven uh, document. Um, this is the culmination of scholars, uh, students, various classrooms who took on uh, exhibits and other types of scholarship within the color conventions. Um, and COVID, there was a real threat at one point in time that this, um, this edited collection wasn't going to come out because of COVID. Um, doing a bit of project management work here to kind of still get the, the process of, of, of a publication of this sorts out was really a bit of a challenge, but we were able to do so. Um, we did the best we could to still have a, uh, a book party and have the celebration that comes with completing such a, an uh, elaborate project. Um, and our students, our students seem to uh, enjoy the process. Um, and the, our uh, last signature event here that we'll talk about is the Mural Arts um, Project. Uh, if you've been in the city of Philadelphia, you know that the, the part of the, 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 the culture here is around these, mural, these sites, um, these mural art sites. Um, we have uh, been asked to, uh, to create a site uh, at the Philadelphia airport. Um, we have been working with um, local artists to, to come up with the designs that we will then put up that will be related to some of the historical scenes related to the color conventions uh, related in, in the local Philadelphia area. Um, this particular event taught me a lot around the utility of digital humanities related projects for, um, for urban communities. One, yes, telling the stories through art and, and the, the conversations that that can promote, that's, that's certainly part of it. But there's also this other um, less spoken about responsibility of the DH project literally being able to acquire resources and funding for that community, right? So we pay, we're able to pay artists, we're able to pay speakers they're able to use that money in their communities the way that they see fit and to have those conversations with those artists and those speakers and you know um you know thinking about the marketplace a thousand dollars for a a lecture is you know fairly common right but for that particular artist who's also identifies as an activist in some spaces as an educator in some spaces that money is doing so much work for them in ways that we just can't see um and there's a a i think a responsibility on our end to be mindful of that and particularly in a time where, again, with it was society shutting down for a moment, this was the only source of income for a lot of those gig economy employ uh, and workers at the time and artists. Um, before, before I say my thank yous, again, uh, the answering the question of, of what has COVID done to my own trajectory, I, I think I would sum it up in saying that it gave it a great pause. Um, on one end, uh, being on the market, um, I saw, I was able to witness all of the jobs that for a particular time go into a hiring freeze because they didn't know what was going to happen with their own budgets and the anxiety that that produced for me. Um, having clear step in and extend our contracts for an additional two years when I seriously did not know <laughs> the natural ongoing kind of system of the of the academy was falling apart that that moment uh, was greatly appreciated uh, 
But at the same time, you know, moving into a new year and, and moving into a new normal to see uh, so many jobs out there right now related specifically to Black data curation, Black digital humanities, both on the faculty side and within the library, I think uh, CLEAR has been at the forefront of legitimizing this space and I don't think it's an accident that so many of the jobs, particularly on the East Coast, have been or related to uh, data studies and justice work as universities are trying to find new opportunities to um, be at the forefront of those conversations and to be quite honest, to be part of a reclamation that these institutions have to their local communities. Um, so I would like to thank Clear uh, for the opportunity and the help to, in their 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 work in legitimizing the space. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. That the scope of these projects, um, many of which seem to be ahead of schedule, and um, you know, doing even more than they thought they could under extremely adverse circumstances, is just wonderful to hear. Um, I don't think we have a lot of we have time to take questions, although um, I would uh, invite people to pop them into the chat and perhaps our fellows can stay with us for a couple minutes to answer chat questions. Um, but let me just thank you all for uh, that was just a wonderful, wonderful set of presentations. Uh, um, you know, this is this is such an important part of our future that you're mapping out. So uh, I very much appreciate you taking time to be with us today. And keep us posted, please. Um, we're going to go on break for about um, eight minutes uh, until um, four o'clock Eastern um, while we get the next session set up and all. Thank you again.